thanks, Judith. And uh, you can check out the Alchemist Cafe at their website, alchemistcafe.com. Um, Dublin dot com. Okay. Uh, I do keep in touch with them. Um, I, I'm actually, just a matter of interest, how many people have been previously to a Science Cafe event organised by the Alchemists? Maybe a quarter. Okay. Uh, so, to the other three quarters, a particular welcome, and let's hope we see you again. As Judith said, we're doing this as an event in uh, uh, cooperation between the Alchemist Cafe and the Irish Science and Technology Journalists Association. We did three cafes during the Euroscience Open Forum in July. Uh, possibly some of you managed to get to the, one of those. Uh, using the same format, three speakers, as it happened, we were taking three speakers who are on the program of ESOT, as it was called, the next day, and we were getting previews of what they would be saying at the conference, and then they batted uh, questions and arguments and issues backwards and forwards between each other and with the audience. Uh, so we're, that's the same format tonight. We're doing a lot of batting around, we hope. There are, I mean, the common theme the, 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 the thread that links our three panels is an interest in the brain, but from quite different perspectives. And perhaps maybe even get to discuss whether the brain and the mind are the same or similar things, uh, because probably some of you would say you're working with the mind, training the mind more than you're concerned with the brain. But anyway, we might come to that. Uh, I hope we will, um, indeed. And we, we're, we're going to keep it at... Um, a fairly general level in the sense that we're trying to figure out what is it that we do know and what do we not know about the brain. Because we're actually, you know, confronting a very interesting paradox here. We're the only species, as far as we know, that know we have a brain. Yeah, virtually, all, virtually all animals, if I'm not mistaken, have a brain in some form, right? But we're the only ones who know we have a brain. And yet probably the part of us that we know least about is the bit that does the knowing, the brain. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting paradox, and I think it's actually very appropriate that in Science Week, we should reflect, uh, maybe not as much, but we should reflect also on the limits of scientific knowledge, as well as on the achievements uh, of, and of scientific knowledge. So most of what we hear going on during Science Week is celebrating what science knows with certainty, or with certain degrees of certainty. Here, perhaps, we're going to explore, as it were, the other side of that coin, the bits that we don't know. Uh, and we're going to start, indeed, with a hypothesis about dementia from Kate here in a moment, uh, which I hope will get challenged. Uh, Can I give you a hypothesis? Yeah, yeah, well, come on, something like that, yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 what we want to do is to keep that discussion going about what we do know, what we don't know, and what the limits of our knowledge might be. In other words, are we condemned to ignorance about the thing that knows uh, and has memories uh, and that allows us to communicate uh, and so on? <coughs> I mean, it's not very long ago that it seemed like, or we were being told we were on the cusp of huge breakthroughs in our knowledge about the brain. Uh, it was the next big thing, you know, the combination of biological information and cognitive sciences was the next big thing. Like many next big things, it seems a bit like the last old small thing. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't materialised in, I think, anything like, or it hasn't delivered anything like what was anticipated even five years ago. Uh, and, and perhaps that's, again, a salutary uh, lesson about the limits of what we can know uh, about the brain. And there are widely divergent views among researchers about the brain as an object of nurture and an object of nature and, uh, and so on. So, how well do we understand the brain? Uh, and uh, how well do we understand how to treat its very many disorders? That's one of our questions for tonight. And that's mainly the question I'm going to uh, throw in a moment to Orla Argon. Can we improve the brain or the mind's performance to take on certain kinds of tasks um, more creatively uh, with a greater critical thinking acumen and so on. That's, I think, a little bit of what we're going to hear from Ari Egan. Uh, but first, because she got the um, trailer of tonight's event uh, in the Irish Times, thanks to Kate Irving. Who, Kate Irving is a lecturer in mental health nursing in, in DCU. What was that? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a really bad Alzheimer's joke. 
However, we'll remind you. Don't worry, Kate. Anytime. Yeah. There are people, I'm sure, who have it cut out here and would have waved at me. Uh, Kate is a, a, a lecturer in mental health nursing who has specialised uh, as a nurse in the care of the elderly and now as a lecturer in mental health uh, nursing in, in, in issues of dementia and she's part of a European project which has just started I think this year very recently uh, with the most impossible acronym um, in fact I have to look it up I think actually there must be an algorithm for, for inventing uh, acronyms uh, when you're doing European projects uh, it's called In Mind, which sounds really interesting, but you, in order to get In Mind, spelt with two Ds, it's actually Innovative Midlife Intervention for Dementia Deterrence. <laughs> Got it? Obvious. Yeah, te teams of specialists sat around at a meeting in Brussels and came up with that one. Um, and that's aiming to develop a new algorithm for assessing dementia risk based on lifestyle behaviours that can be changed. And by some weird coincidence, Kate's also involved in something that sounds a little bit like the event that we're at tonight. Not the Alchemist Cafe, but the Alzheimer's Cafe uh, in North Dublin, where I take it people who have this condition meet and share their experiences and support each other and so on. Anyway, I'm going to ask each of you, what's your current preoccupation? What's your current concern with understanding better uh, how the brain works, and specifically, Kate, in the context of dementia? Okay. <clears throat> well... I think the first thing that we really need to think about when we're thinking about the brain is it's a grey matter. And we, should, we would do well to remember that before we make any two black and white claims about what we know or what we don't know about the brain. So that's my opening gap bit. It's a grey matter. There are, shit, there, there, are, there are arguments about what we know about the brain, but these are not definitive facts. They are arguments that can be made. So specifically in relation to cognitive health, which we all have, you know, some people have dementia, but we all have cognitive health. We're all on a spectrum of cognitive health somewhere along the line. And uh, my main preoccupation is that um, maintaining and hanging on to our cognitive health is something that we have a lot of control over. That at least 50% of our um, ability to stay cognitively healthy is attributable to our lifestyle factors, things that we can do to stay um, well cognitively. And um, specifically, researchers in uh, America looked at seven lifestyle factors, including smoking, diabetes, um, midlife obesity, midlife high cholesterol, um, depression, and depression is arguably reversible, I know, but that's another argument. My husband always says I argue far too much, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so there are these, these lifestyle factors, and they, they give us 50% of our risk for dementia. And I, what, I, I need to say, what I'm saying there is not that they cause you to get dementia, or that they, if you have, don't have them, that you won't get dementia. There's still always a risk, just as with smoking. You can, get, you can smoke and you can get away without getting lung cancer, but it's very unlikely. If you have all seven of these risks, then you are just as likely to get dementia as if you smoke and you get, and you are likely to get lung cancer. So this is huge, and I don't think this is something that the public really know too much about, and it's something that there is no, very little investment in, in research terms, and I think that's, I think that's awful, I think that's shocking. And, and why should, why might that be? Well, I, if I was being very sceptical, I'd say it's because of the pharmaceutical industry. They have no vested interest in letting people know this information. And so they obviously want money to design drugs. And so we have this situation where, as a general public, we've swallowed the myth that we are waiting for some sort of cure for, uh, some cure or, or, or pill that we can take to maintain our cognitive health, some sort of fountain of youth that we can all bathe in or swallow a pill that will maintain our cognitive health as we age, which is the most ludicrous suggestion ever when you really unpick it and you think about, well, obviously, it's a, you know, a dementia or cognitive health is always going to be a complex thing that's based on the way you live your life and the genetic inheritance and lots of other different things. You know, genetic inheritance we can't do anything about at this point in time. But um, the, point, the point is really that uh, 
that's, that's a message that's not known in the public too much, and that it should be. That 50% of your cognitive health is about the way that you live your life, at least 50%. So the research that has just been funded is looking a lot more at those, inter the, those risk factors and how they interact, and understanding a lot more about if you have two or three of them, um, which one of them would make the most difference to your not getting um, a cognitive health problem in later life. Um, is that five minutes? It's, it's uh, at the start of five minutes, but uh, let me just ask you, um, if the public are not aware of this to the extent that you think they should be, actually, do those who work in the area of research and treatment of Alzheimer's share that perspective generally, or are there other perspectives, other views? Um, that's, I, that's a from my experience um, of working uh, Senior researchers in, in Europe and in America are very committed to the idea that we will find a drug to stop people from getting dementia or we'll, find, or, or we'll engineer a vaccine, which the recent research that's been done on vaccines has just failed. The three vaccines they looked at, none of them worked. One of them they're taking forward to some more trials. But, uh, there's, there's no, there, doesn't, there isn't much stomach in, in the research community to look into uh, lifestyle factors um, I mean, obviously, I've just been funded, so there's some stomach for it. But, but the, the vast majority of research funding is going into trying to find a drug to halt, trying to find biomarkers to um, predict what, who's going to get dementia in the future and do something about them not getting it through a pharmaceutical fix. Is that what we might call a medicalization of the problem? And, and your perspective is, is very definitely not a medicalization yes. perspective. Yes. Yeah. We should now refer to the medics and see what they think about this, but uh, we might, we'll come to you in, 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 in due course. There's a finger up there in the middle, and I'm going to give you a chance. We, we just take one straight away. Okay, just... just uh, there's a quick question to Katie. Yeah? Really quick question. I'm, so I'm just curious just to know what are the seven risk factors? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, let me see if I reel them up. Smoking, midlife obesity, midlife hypertension, high blood pressure, midlife high cholesterol, um, depression, oh. diabetes. diabetes, and uh, probably a cognitive inactivity. And that's measured largely, and we need, this is one thing that InMind's going to look at a lot more, largely that's measured because it's easiest and because our data sets usually have information about how many years people spent in school before they were 18. Cognitive activity is largely measured by what schooling you did up to the age of 18. So we don't really know, and we think that that probably does confer the greatest uh, cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve is this theory that if you have more of it, you can lose some of it. And that's actually, all there are no more about this, but that actually just the size of your brain, the circumference of your head, there's a, there's, a, there's a correlation between your risk of dementia and just the physical size of your brain. Um, and... Uh, so there's that, there's the mechanics of your brain and the hardware of your brain, but there's also an idea of cognitive reserve, which is more about the ways you manage to use your brain circuitry to circumnavigate problems. So, you know, very often I see people in clinic who have quite extensive memory problems, but what, what, they've ma what they manage to do is still communicate beautifully using quite odd words for the word that they need, but you still know and they're still functioning, they're still in their communities, but you know that there's quite a lot of cognitive problems going on. So that's cognitive reserve. So that's the last risk factor, is people who don't manage to build cognitive reserve, and we're not quite sure who they are, but currently that's mainly measured by the years of school you did before you were 18. Yeah. This is sort of well, <coughs> is there any uh, the big the biggest risk factors for dementia are heart disease. The biggest known risk, uh, 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 yeah, and the, well, sorry, the biggest risk factor is older age. So the longer you live. So then there's all sorts. I get in all of these arguments because I say, oh, people should um, have these better lifestyles. And then I was talking to an old age psychiatrist, a very esteemed old age psychiatrist, and he was saying, yeah, well, I've done some modeling studies of my own case, and um, 
If you make all those people stop smoking and lower their blood pressure, they'll live longer, and because they're older, they'll get more dementia. So actually, you're going to make people have more dementia, not less dementia. Well, I like to argue that there will always be competing morbidities and that people will all die of something at some, at some stage. And, uh, you know... That's not my question. Go on, then, sorry. Because the risk factors, if I line, I would tend to think correlate with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So is, it, is there any evidence, therefore, that Alzheimer's also correlates? I don't think I don't think there is. Do you know? Yeah. Or like, yeah, so so I, I I do part time epidemiology in my spare time, and um, I mean I, I, some of my research is in epidemiology. And what Kate is saying, it's it's uh, you're right. Uh, some of the comorbidities that she's talking about, the things that uh, Kate is talking about, um, the lifestyle things, you're right. They're much commoner in lower socioeconomic groups. Uh, but you balance out against the age effect. Uh, so, so, and also because um, dementia, we use the term dementia as a kind of a hold all you know, uh, phrase, but in fact, there are many different types of dementia. And many of the factors of Kate, um, as referring to, are, are primarily factors that, risk, that increase our cardiovascular, cerebrovascular risk, which you know can contribute to cognitive impairment and interacts with the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So, so how to unpick that and say, okay, this is pure Alzheimer's and this is pure you know, bad lifestyle. That's one of the big challenges that we have in the 21st century, understanding that. So, so you're right, you would think that that would be the case, but actually the, it, it balances out. And, and keep, keep the mic over now, because I'm going to go up to you now. Okay. Well, Very just, and Alzheimer's shares the same risk factors largely with vascular dementia and other types of dementia as well. So. Uh, there are some obvious types of dementia that are caused very obviously by drinking too much or, or boxing or things like that, but uh, a lot of the dementias share, and certainly Alzheimer's and vascular dementia share the risk factors, the vascular risk factors, and we don't quite know why. We don't have a good explanation. Yeah, we can't tell the difference. <laughs> That's really, why it's in life. Okay, let's, let's just move on to some uh, other topics for, for general discussion, but I'm sure we'll come back to that. And I think uh, I, I take from what Kate has said the reversibility of the process uh, and, and the possibility that we have some control over the process that is not inevitable. Um, however, that, uh, the person who just spoke there a minute ago, uh, just in case you don't know, is Professor Orla Hardiman, who is a consultant neurologist in the Beaumont Hospital and a professor of neurology in in Trinity College, Dublin, specialising in uh, motor neuron disease, except it's not called motor neuron disease when she's <laughs> dealing with it. It's okay. called ALS. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm kind of interested in neurodegeneration in general. Uh, motor neuron disease is one of the, or ALS, in my truth, in natural fibrosis, or Lou Gehrig disease, or whatever. You know, there are many names, but yeah, that's, that's what would be my main research interest. But it's one of the family of neurodegenerations. But I went to, I, I went to genealogy because the brain is so interesting. It's a really interesting part of us. I mean, it's what makes us who we are. We are our brains. You know, we, if you can't do a brain transplant, you can do a heart transplant or a liver transplant, you're still you. If you can't do a brain transplant, if you do a brain transplant, you're somebody else. <laughs> so the brain is, you know, the brain is, is everything. The brain is what we are, who we are. We're, we're uh, organising a um, the European Commission um, has a uh, month of the brain um, next year, in May next year. And actually, we have the European presidency in May in next year as well. So we're, we're hosting one of the... Um, one of the one of the months we're hosting a whole series of uh, things around the brain in May next year. But the European Commission is funding a big conference in the end of May for policymakers, and uh, um, we're we're um, working on the uh, the title of the the, the uh, meeting. I want to call it the fascinating brain, and I want to call it the first session, which we're going to ask uh, one of the big um, neuroscientists who also is a is a, uh, a manages one of the big funding agencies in the UK. I want to call it uh, funding the brain. A no brainer because that's <laughs> so, so the brain is really interesting. And, and one of the things that, that we're learning about, I, I have to say that I fundamentally disagree with the con with what you say about the fact that we don't know or can we ever know. Um, we are the brain is the final frontier frontier to quote um, Captain Kirk. Um, 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 and I, it really is, but um, and the the changes and the research that's happening in the brain is incremental. And if I look back at what we knew when I started uh, out as a young, young thing, a young gal, uh, what to think about being a neurologist, and where I am now, I'm just an L, uh, sitting up here, um, 
Uh, the amount of changes that have happened, the, the seismic shift that's happened in our understanding of the brain in that um, certain number of years uh, plus that, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just truly amazing. You know, when, when I started out um, uh, here in Dublin as, as a trainee neurologist in the Richmond, which has gone a long time, uh, we, we had one CAT scanner in Dublin, one, that was in the Richmond. Um, I worked in Vincent's as an intern at UBS, so to go over by ambulance with people uh, to have their brain scans done. Now we have MRI scanners in every, you know, every small village in Ireland has an MRI scanner. It's revolutionised what we understand about the brain. But not only that, but the MRI scan now doesn't just give you a picture of your brain, but we can do all sorts of really fancy studies of the MRI scan that really help us understand both the structure of the brain and also the working brain. The MRI scan now can, can show us what the brain looks like when we're doing stuff. It's called functional MRI. And we're also, we can also do things like we can do really really, well, the mathematicians and, and um, uh, the, the, the hardcore people who can do bioinformatics uh, we, um, can, can look at the, the computer models that are made out of the scanning that we do, and they can reconstruct the brain in many different iterations, and can start looking at pathways and networks, and we know now that uh, the brain is made of all these different networks, we know the brain is dynamic, and um, Kate talked about the dynamism of the brain. We used to think when I was in medical school, that you know, the brain, uh, when, when um, the brain was formed, it couldn't change. We know now from lots of work that's going on, both at a cognitive side and, and uh, um, uh, uh, psychological side of things, that the brain is very plastic. Ian Robertson here at Trinity has done many, much work on this around brain rehabilitation. I think Arlene's going to talk about that as well. The brain is plastic in the way that it works. We can reprogram the brain. We know that uh, at a biological level that the brain can can partially re reconstitute itself. This is this is heresy when I was when I was a medical student. Um, it's a really really fascinating organ. It's a really fascinating discipline. The field is moving so quickly. We're being, we're learning more and more about how the brain works, how to protect the brain, how to to uh, look at what makes the brain do what it does. The the the, the, um, the, the complex connections in the brain. The fact that. Uh, neurons, which are the grey matter that, that, um, that Kate talked about, are not really the most important part. The neurons themselves, coupled with all the cells around the neurons, called the glia, which glia means glue, because we used to think that the glia was just a bit of kind of cells that kind of sit around keeping the neurons do what they're supposed to do. Glia are really important. In fact, Albert Einstein's brain didn't have any more neurons in it, it had more glia in it. So, so, the, so we're understanding much more about how the brain works, how the nerve cells connect to each other, what, the, what, the, what those individual nerve cells do for each other, how, they, how when you damage one set of nerve cells, what, what impact that has on the other nerve cells around it, what the immune system does in the brain, that's something we didn't understand until very recently. This is a really fascinating evolving area. It is, it is very much the 21st century, and I've no doubt that within the next 20, 30 years we will be another... Uh, order of magnitude or another order of magnitude away from where we are even today. Um, and hopefully we'll all be still alive because we'll all have done the things that Kate will have us to do. We'll all stop drinking and we'll all start running and we'll all play bridge and play piano. No, we can drink with just one glass of wine and that's <laughs> no use to anyone. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be all be sitting here in 30 years' time and we'll all look great. <laughs> and we'll be all pondering all the things that we know about the brain um, that we didn't know 30 years ago. But but you, many of you will have here will have seen Orla in that uh, very poignant documentary about motor neuron disease earlier in the year, uh, centred on Colin Murray's really artful kind of investigation of his own condition as an investigation of the condition in general. Um, and and the take home message was we don't know how to treat it. Just uh, yeah. I mean, where does that fit with the scenario you just? Well, I see. See, I think I think it's like. Um, it's like a duck gliding along, you know, the duck is gliding along the top of the water and you think the duck is just doing that, sitting there, not even, you know, but only the water, so it's patting, patting madly, and that's what's happening. When I started with neurosis, it was about 20 years Sorry, ago. Sorry, who's the duck and who's the legs? It's a metaphor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> the paddling is us scientists. You know, All right. And the duck is what you see. The duck is the disease and the paddling is what's going on in the right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a simple guy. <laughs> uh, so, so the 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 what's happened? I think you're right. You know, 
I see uh, people in our MD clinic, and I still can't make the money energies go away, that's for sure. And I can't even really stop it yet. Uh, but, but I'm much more confident that I have a much more understanding, greater understanding of what cause of energies. And I also know now that, uh, for example, even the simple example of a disease like money energies, which you would think it says, it does what it says on the tin, but you a disorder of motor neurons. We know now, and some of them are actually were leaders in Ireland, world leaders in this way, that motor neurons is not just one disease, in fact, it's, it's one of a number of different diseases that are different causes and different, the, the, the way that the disease progresses is different, and we're beginning to unpick why that is. So, so part of, I, I, I also actually disagree a little bit with Kate Long, and I understand why you say it, about the, you know, the, the, the pharma, the industry, and the industry wanting to develop drugs. I actually like industry, and I think that it's a simple. We have, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, um, you know, we should be careful about about trashing industry because industry, um, the industry does give us drugs, and, and you know, we have to keep them to task. But, um, but, but, but I think that you know they, they need to work with us, and we need to work with them to understand disease. And one of the things that that um, happens badly is that we have a disease that we don't really understand very well. We throw a drug at it. And the drug doesn't work, well then we blame the pharma, you know, or we blame the drug. But in fact, a lot of the time we should be blaming us as doctors and us as clinical scientists. We we have some culpability there because we need to say to industry, well actually there's a subgroup here and that looks a bit different than the subgroup there. I like to use the analogy of cancer actually. I like to use the analogy of breast cancer. Because when I was a, a young gal, uh, uh, breast cancer you got it and you got pumped up with poison and you might live or you mightn't. Depending, and, and we didn't really know. Some people did very well with the breast cancer, and some people did very badly. And then we got biomarkers. We got biomarkers that said you have estrogen positive, or you're Herceptin positive, or you're, and we have a gene, and we, you're, you're BRAC positive, you're BRAC negative. Suddenly, breast cancer became not one disease, but many diseases. And once we had many different types of breast cancer, we had many different targeted therapies. And now the, the life expectancy for breast cancer is 80% if you get it early, 85% even. I think we're on the cusp of that in brain disease. I think that it's much harder to take a biopsy of the brain and say, or of a neurodegeneration, say, you know, you have this type and this is the drug. But we're getting there. And one of the things that we're working on is to try and figure out how do you subcategorize, you know? And I, I think the, the, that's what I was saying to the case, you know, Alzheimer's disease and, and vascular disease are actually probably slightly different. And, you know, the, the factors that modulate the development of, of you know, vascular dementia, which is a really important type of dementia, may, may partly you know, attenuate the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but it, you know, there's probably a role for, for vaccination if we can get it right, or for other therapeutic agents that clean up the plaques and tangles that, that increase your risk of getting the disease. So, so you know, there's a role for both, I think. But one of the things that we need to do as clinic, clinical scientists and translational scientists, people who are at the end of the thing where we're seeing people, we're seeing the patients, we're not in the lab working on the rats, is um, we have to be able to deliver the, the group of people who are most likely to have to respond to the right drug. So the right drug that has to get into the right person at the right time with the right dose. And we're we're not quite there yet with drugs, but we're not far away. But Carl was on a clinical trial, we know the results of that drug at the end of this year, beginning of next year. If that's positive, that's a big change because that means that that and, and, and one of the things we'll be doing with that particular trial is we'll be unpicking who was bonded. We didn't have, there's, there's a massive breakthrough that happened in motor neuron disease by an Irish guy, actually, one of my ex students. And last year, when we identified um, about 10% of motor neuron disease is one big gene that causes it now. And so if we can separate that out, that's like a rat gene of cancer. And it's particularly prevalent in the Irish population, is that right? It's, it's, uh, the Irish population is. Um, uh, where the, we, we were a little bit, uh, we didn't have as many, um, well the Roman Empire didn't get here, and so the Roman Empire were great at doing ethnic cleansing and, and moving people around, so we didn't have that, um, uh, so we didn't tend to um, get as much um, uh, extra genetic input into Ireland, in such a good way. Um, very, very, coast, very, very delicately put. East yeah. coast we did. <laughs> so we, so precisely. So, so the genetic diversity in Ireland is a little bit lower than other countries. We contrasted that with Cuba, where so I do some work at in Cuba as well. And we looked at the rate of motor neuron disease in Cuba versus the rate of motor neuron disease in Ireland. It's very interesting. So the rate of motor neuron disease in Cuba is lower than in Ireland, but you can separate the Cuban population out based on skin colour. And it's a reasonable proxy for their genetic background. 
So there's a white population that are Spanish mostly, although there's a 20% black gene genetic contribution. The mixed population is 50-50, and then the black population is 80% African and 20%. So the rate of motor neuron disease in the white population is about half that in Ireland. The rate of the black population is about half that in Ireland. And the rate of the mixed population is a quarter of that in Ireland. So it's, we know this in, in, in animals, you know, hybrid robustness. The mongrel dog is always the cleverest one. <laughs> Yeah, our mongrel dog is 14 years old and shouldn't be alive still. There you exactly. are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Orla. We'll move on to uh, Dr. Arlene Egan, who uh, runs a, an outfit called Building to Think, uh, which uh, acts for clients uh, in business, providing uh, training in creative thinking, in problem solving, in critical thinking. She also lectures in the National College of Ireland and in DCU Business School. And she's worked with sports teams, with coaches and with athletes, getting them into creative and problem-solving uh, mode. So apparently you can teach us how to use our brains better, is that right? Yeah, I can. I, I believe I can. Um, the, I suppose I come from a different perspective to Orla and Kate. I have a psychology background. So when I had done my general psychology degree, I had gotten into that whole area of study because people absolutely fascinated me. And the differences between people was what I was drawn to most. The big question that always guided me was how come some people cope in different situations better than others? So I was very interested in working out you know, what makes people more resilient? What makes people cope better, especially in the face of adversity? And I've been very privileged um, during my time to get to know uh, and to have some experience working with some of the Paralympic athletes. Because if you're ever in a, in a situation where you're the most able-bodied person in the room, but your plate is the sloppiest, and you know, you're, you're covered in you know, crumbs, and you know, you're just making a disgrace of yourself, and you've got people around you who have managed to adapt so well, to think so positively, um, and just, you know, with a completely different outlook. Ooh. Of life, um, you know, it, it makes you really wonder about the differences mentally in the way that people think. So, you know, having uh, always had an interest in sport and being an athlete myself growing up, um, it seemed logical for me then to go on to try to understand more about the way that people think um, and learn. And I was delighted to hear Orla, because it's always great when you know your, your thoughts and your own theories are being supported by a, a neuroscientist. And, you know, uh, it's great that um, it, when it comes to learning, I was always uh, fascinated by the fact that we can learn deeper and we can learn better you know, with the more connections uh, and the more we focus and the more we concentrate on the topics that we're learning. And I was you know, set off uh, around different colleges trying to teach 18-year-olds this concept. <laughs> if looks could kill, I had that tongue in the back tooth look with the arms folded, like, oh my god, what are you talking about? So uh, that was an experience that made me tough for life, I can tell you. Um, they weren't ready to hear that message, but uh, fortunately, you know, it, it, that comes, I suppose, with learning. And um, when I got into different groups and different mixes, uh, understanding more about the value of this concept we call critical thinking. When I was able to, to take this concept um, that we now hear being promoted highly within our education system, um, out to the corporate world who were going, oh my god, was this always around? How come nobody taught me? I was trying to teach you, but you wouldn't listen to me. Um, so, you know, being able to think effectively, being able to, to understand that there's always more than one solution to the challenge that we face. Now, that, that's um, a big lesson for people, and I'm sure that Orla and Kate have both seen this uh, with the clients that they work with, the adaptability uh, and just different mindsets and how they can produce completely different results um, in, in situations. So, you know, working with the Building to Think, which we set up you know, last year to help corporate clients, to help um, students, and still my athletes, you know, which, who I hold very dear, um, we, we set about trying to train them in this creative problem-solving process that gets them to think, to think, you know, much, uh, much more broadly, um, take in different types of perspectives, um, and just to, to look around and to see 
the value of searching for solutions from different sides and pushing the boundaries of thought to places that they, they didn't think that they could get inspiration from or ideas from or solutions from. And you know, in, in our work, we work with um, students from the age of eight who are fantastic. Uh, and it just reminds you, it brings you back to the notion that, you know, life can seem limitless. You know, um, we, we often give them challenges to, uh, to try to complete in teams. And it's amazing how fearful eight-year-olds are of their life. Everything has um, fire rockets and uh, you know big gantries and, and there's electric fences. The CIA and the FBI will be proud with the ideas that they can come up with for national security. But you know they're a great source of inspiration. And then as we find we move up through the education system and we're asking say the transition year students to think of challenges and to think of solutions, you know we, we automatically find there's a difference in terms of levels of thought of willingness to actually expand which you know, touches into what Kate was talking about, building this cognitive reserve. So being able to you know, force or to apply or to engage um, in thought at a, meaningful, at a meaningful way differs, um, it seems, across the age groups uh, and also you know, from situation to situation. So where we find ourselves now with Building to Think is we're working a lot trying to um, help build resilience, especially in this time where um, people in industry, where people in life are so challenged by the you know, socio-economic climate that we find ourselves in, that they're being forced to think more creatively, you know, just in order to, to get by from day to day. So in terms of um, the uh, critical thinking element, the creativity and the problem solving, it all started off simply by looking around me and seeing that different people cope differently in situations. And it was that burning question of what's going on in the mind. You know, how is it that the mind can you know, either lead people down a dark place or get people to go, you know what, I'm going to look at this completely different and try and pull myself you know, up or out of this hole or out of this situation, wherever they were finding themselves in. So it was from that question that I asked as an undergraduate, um, I was able to start building you know, this pathway to try to discover, to try to meet as many people as I could to learn more about you know, these kinds of key differences and to work with different groups so that you know, this knowledge and this information can you know, be put together so that it can help to inspire us and to inform us um, going forward. Okay, let's, let's just uh, take a, a quick response to that. Does anybody want a quick question to Arlene? Yeah, is it on that, particularly on that, Jeff? Okay, well, if, if, there's, if there isn't anything particularly to Arlene uh, at this precise moment, there's somebody way back there. Paul, would you take the roving mic if you have an idea? Um, I, I think uh, our video maker would like to be able to get you through the mic. Yeah, Which one do you like? The red one, the blue one, do you like? Hi. Um, how do you apply your work? Um, yes, absolutely. So where we see this work, um, especially the research that's been done in the States, we call it in the area of citizenship. Um, so it's you know, the ability to help people to make better choices, to evaluate information more effectively. And one of the things from the education perspective that has taught us is that the flow of information that we're getting into the brain um, has you know, become so much faster that our expectations of you know, producing results, of thinking about things, has, has made everything much more quicker and automatic. So we would work with uh, community groups, you know, helping them around problem solving, decision making, evaluation, and um, within their own communities as well, just to, to, to promote this, if you like, uh, and start building this within the masses. Anybody else out there? Okay, look, we'll, we'll, we have now, I think that's the microphone facing the loudspeaker. We have now a half an hour or so uh, until, uh, Believe it or not, food arrives. I don't know if the cater is allowed for quite this large number of people. But anyway, there'll be a nibble for every. There'll be a nibble for everybody. Okay. Okay. We have a couple of questions. Excellent. And and you can direct them to any or all of the panels. Okay. One, two, three. There in the middle, and then at the back, and then that, that down here. Okay. Go ahead.
believe that we have in our digestive system, and also that the heart has something like a tiny brain in it. Now, I'm probably not remembering this correctly, but I was wondering if you could elaborate, and if anybody knows, are we actually thinking about stomachs and the heart as well as the brain? The things you learn from Oprah. Yeah. Actually, we'll hold the question and we'll just take take the person at the back as well. Um, that's it? Okay. Yeah, here at the front. Oh, good. We've got to a really serious question. I think, I think that piece of uh, research is actually the subject of a documentary on BBC One later tonight, and we'll get you home in time for that. Uh, according to some listings, it's 10.35, and according to others, it's 11.05. But I'm pretty sure that's what that's about. Okay, we'll, we'll come to the, 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 the neurons in the stomach and, and that one. Okay, Rep, go ahead. Um, I was up there about two years ago called The Brain That Changes Itself. And uh, no, I'm sure it was a, a very pompous book or, book or whatever, but I just wonder if any of the ideas are, are um, you know, have a real grain of truth in them. Now, one of them was that um, if you had a stroke and uh, part of your brain died off, that you could actually retrain a new section of the brain to operate an arm or a leg or whatever. So, so, so the first question there is, is references something called the autonomic nervous system. So we have a, um, uh, we, our, our nervous system is divided into the brain and the spine, and then there's, they, they send um, uh, nerves out into the, the body, to our muscles and our, and our, our skin, and our internal organs. And then there's another, what we call the visceral system, which runs the inner innards. And there are networks of nerves within the, the, our innards. Uh, within the uh, called the autonomic nervous system, and there are little little groups of nerves that, that control bits of our autonomic nervous system, and there is a little pacemaker in our heart that makes our heart beat regularly. So they don't think, as far as I know. Uh, but then the question is, well, you know, how do we think from our head anyway? So that's a, a whole other question. The the point about the PBS persistent resident <coughs> state this draws on something that was done originally in Oxford or Cambridge, I think it was, that was published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago which was using this uh, MRI that I was talking about earlier, where they were looking at, um, uh, uh, they were asking, I think, people to imagine uh, playing tennis. And a, a small, very small percentage, maybe, um, I think, two or five percent, a very small number of people who were in a persistent vegetative state uh, did respond um, using, but by, um, using the function MRI, you could see that they were activating parts of the brain that you'd expect you to activate it. The pod playing tennis. Now, whether that is consciousness and, and how how that relates to consciousness is actually quite a difficult and, and fraught question. The the PBS is 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 a is a difficult area anyway. I'm not sure that it's it necessarily leads into a, a discussion about euthanasia because that's a whole other discussion around around capacities. You know, the whole point about euthanasia is that you have capacity that you're able to decide. So you you're talking about. Um, active euthanasia, as opposed, you know, people people being put to death because, you know, because because they're no longer worth living. And that's a whole, you know, that, that's not what that's about. The, the discussion about euthanasia are about at the moment anywhere about people uh, having having made a, a, a conscious decision, you know, after a lot of consideration that they want to finish their life. So it's a slightly different argument. Yeah, but um, there's some patients who have been in that state for decades. And at what point people sort of think, okay, well, I'm going to turn it. Well, I mean, it, it, that's, I mean, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to try and. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's an incredibly, uh, that's a, an incredibly fraught area. Yeah. And uh, it, it gets into a whole lot of 
issues around inadequate mental ethics, mm. around around what the person might have wanted in advance, and and what um, what sort of interventions that you would make that would be life sustaining or life saving or 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 preserving life. And so so that there's a whole set of issues around that. For example, the persistent mental states don't aren't necessarily not ventilators. They're usually can breathe by themselves. So so uh, you don't necessarily turn on a ventilator on the PBS. You, you may or may not depend. You know, you could you could have somebody who's breathing on their own who's just who's just comatose or, or you could have somebody who's for, on a ventilator. And and the issue then is in we have a whole system, the American Academy of Neurology has put out a whole set of documents around this as well. You know, from an ethical point of view about how, how you would deal with that in terms of the likelihood of recovery. Because it's one thing to say these people are aware that the question is, you know, what is the possibility of recovery and what is their life and quality of life and how do you measure that? And they're really fraught issues. It would be an instinct program to watch, I'm sure, because they're really fraught issues. I think it might be, it might be a really uh, difficult thing if you're, sort of, someone, if you're aware that someone is aware of what's going on but there's no likelihood of recovery. Like, how do you approach that? How do you, you know, if you know that this person is never going to, you know, gain, regain consciousness or is never going to, but you know that they're fully aware of what's going on. Well, if they're, if they're aware, they'd, they'd be conscious. If they're aware, they'd be conscious. You can't be unconscious and aware or conscious and unaware. Sorry, I mean, yeah. well, I mean, I mean, able to communicate. Yeah, I mean, there is, I mean, the, the butterfly and the dive, the, yeah, the butterfly yeah. and the diving belt, yeah, the, the, so it goes into that, that's a yeah. locked in state. So it's a slightly different neurological condition as well. And those people are where you can have a good quality of life, as, as was demonstrated in the butterfly of diving belt. You couldn't have a very good, or Simon Fitz Morris, I don't know if anybody saw the Irish Times today. Yeah. Simon Fitz Morris talks about his quality of life, you know, being, being basically, you know, um, fully paralyzed and on a breathing mm -hmm. machine with both neurons. So, I mean, you know, how do you measure quality of life? That's a whole other issue as well. Do you, want, do you want to take the question about uh, the third question was, was sort of about brain's, brain's capacity to kind of re yeah, re yeah. So, itself? so one of the things that we learned um, recently, I mean, what happened in the 20th century was we had this idea that there were parts of the brain that controlled things, and that's partly true. For example, if you damage the left part of your brain towards the front, uh, most people will lose their language, something that's called Broca's area. So we know if you do that, but but uh, but there are other parts of the brain that if you, if you damage, you can regain, if you gain, have some recovery, or, and particularly in children, if you damage parts of the brain, other parts of the brain can take over. So there, there is quite a bit of what we call plasticity within the brain, and, and some of the things that Ian talks about, Ian Robertson, and, and really you, you, you talk about as well, is, is trying to find ways of, of, of enhancing uh, those parts of the brain to recruit parts of the brain that wouldn't normally be in use. So, so absolutely, there's a quite a degree of plasticity. It gets, it's better when you're younger, because it isn't quite as good as when you're older, but it's certainly that the other parts of the brain can take, over, can take over. There's quite a lot of plasticity and redundancy in, in, in terms of what things what the brain can do, because the brain is, is, is a series of networks as well as, as a series of sort of discrete anatomical areas. Okay, you keep moving the factor. Hi, uh, question for everybody, I guess. So just, you seem very optimistic about where your science is headed. I'm not so optimistic, maybe. Because it seems to me the analogy has been made in the like 18th century anatomy. You're just beginning to carve things up, you're just beginning to see how it's all put together. But you don't really have, really have any true understanding of what's going on. It's just a very complex system. And I hear something like Bill O'Reilly Chandler in the book, talks about learning from the brain by brain damaged patients, you know, where somebody will have a blind side of that. And that wasn't deduced from your neurological energy and your neurochemical energy of the brain. That's deduced from kind of logical deductive reasoning of how the brain must be put together based on what was damaged and what was therefore missing. So I don't know, maybe you can elaborate a bit more about this neuroimaging of the brain and where you see it take this and how about it is really the well, blind side was described by Anton, actually, in the 19th century, it's called Anton syndrome. Uh, so mu much of the classical neurology that I learned was, was learned was, was taught uh, eponymously. There's, there's names for everything because there were people, a lot of French actually, French and American, uh, uh, great describers. I mean, neurology is a very descriptive uh, condition. Neurological disorders are very descriptive. But I, but I, I have to disagree with you that that. that you know, we, we haven't, that, that, that we shouldn't be optimistic when the things aren't moving forward. And I think, I think that um, what, the, what imaging is doing is actually is challenging a lot of the way we think, in fact. Um, 
a combination of imaging, some of the better uh, use of genetics in terms of animal modeling, uh, generating models of disease and understanding how diseases operate based on, on generating genetic models of, of animals. So uh, uh, I think both the, the, those two things, the Human Genome Project, which has allowed us to do that, and neuroimaging are probably the two biggest things that have revolutionized how we understand. So, so all of the, um, you know, many of the, the ways that we understand how the brain works are drawn from, from as you write, from, as you say, from sort of anatomic description, but many of those are, are, are refined considerably with imaging now, that we can, we can look at the, what's going on in the damaged brain and look at the, the, uh, the changes in imaging or at least through pathology now with imaging. Uh, but, but more recently we can do it in the normal brain, we look at the normal functioning brain and look at the normal functioning brain at rest using function imaging and activated function imaging. There's a really, one of the European, um, the events, European, yes, uh, European science of the forum speakers, I don't know if anybody heard of, was uh, Christian Caceres. Was anybody at his talk, the empathic brain? Uh, He's, he's, he's doing, a, he, did, he comes out of a, a, a sort of a neurophysiology background uh, where he's sticking electrodes into one piece of measuring what is happening. And, and he moved into uh, looking at, at how we do empathy in the brain. And his most recent work, I'm going to collaborate with him, I just talked to him last week by phone, is looking at the, um, uh, the way the brain responds to emotion. And we couldn't ever do that in that imaging. Uh, looking at what parts of the brain have activated in response to emotion how we empathize with people, what the differences are in different people and the way that we react to emotion. There's gender differences as well. There are differences depending on whether you're part of a, a single individual or part of a group. Uh, there are differences uh, um, uh, depending on the emotion. That there's none of that we would be able to understand without, without the availability of, of your imaging. That helps us to understand how the brain works. It also helps us in, in, in states that are abnormal, it's done some work on autism. He's done some work in schizophrenia, he's done some work in, 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 in psychopaths as well. So, so I think we're just at the beginning. I mean, MRI has only been around about 25 years, you know, and functional MRI really, really only about 10 or 15 years. So, I mean, this, we're at the cusp of something really big now. You know, this is going to be huge. And then this, you can do combinations of MRI and brainwave testing. We're, we're doing a little bit of that here in Trinity, uh, with something called Spectral EG, where you can do a, a big cap full of. Uh, of electrodes in your brain and then get a, get a, a, um, a mathematical model in again, very clever mathematicians, not me, um, uh, looking at patterns in the brain and understanding how patterns operate and how they change in, 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 in disease states. So I think these things are, are tell us a huge amount of what's going on and help us to piece together how diseases progress. So I have to say I disagree with you. But did you want to comment? Do you want to? Because I well, can ask you anything. <laughs> well, I suppose you know I have a, a slightly different, um, a slightly different take on, you know, I, I uh, diseases of the brain. But I'm really the only one I know anything about is dementia because it's the, the only area that I've worked in. Um, the, 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 the the neuroimaging isn't part of the diagnostics criteria for whether or not you have. Measure. It, it may be, it may be, but there's controversy, there's, there's con controversy over that, <laughs> but it isn't currently, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it gives us a particular perspective on cognitive health, which is a medicalised view of cognitive health, and it blindsides us to other perspectives on cognitive health, which may, it may in, the short, in the very short term, make much more impact on disease epidemiology and that's what concerns me and, and it's not that I'm totally anti big pharma it's not that I have a massive issue with uh, GlaxoSmithKline or any of the other multinational drug companies who you know I'm very glad that somebody invented antibiotics when I have tonsillitis it's great because they work but for dementia the drugs that have been developed so far work moderately well in about a third of people. And we don't know who they are because we don't know which ones have Alzheimer's and which ones have vascular and which ones have mixed. And so the, the, it's been a resounding disaster. And that may be due to our fault, as Ola says, that may be our fault for not giving them the right people, the right drugs at the right time. I, I accept all of those arguments. But the, the, the fact is that our cognitive health is not something we should be sitting around waiting for a pill to be developed to stop us getting it. It's something that we actively need to engage with and take some responsibility for. And 
the, the, the power of big pharma, the power of the neuro, the, the biomarker industry, gives rise to a silencing of the, the logic, of, the, the pure logic of the fact that we all live lives and they take some toll on our bodies and that we are all going to age and there should be no concept that there'll be a fountain of youth or a pill that we take to stop us from cognitively aging. And dementia is a, a problem of aging, essentially, although some people can get it younger. Um, but it's, it's most, most predominantly a problem of aging and people, we all age differently. And I, I, I think that there's, there's a blindsiding from the, the, the domination of the, the medicalized view of, of what cognitive health is. No, 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 no. <laughs> Um, your 50% uh, risk factors, uh, sorry, your, your, your risk, seven risk factors yeah, amounting to 50% of the risk of, of dementia leaves another 50% to be accounted for. Yeah. Roughly what is that? Genetics. Uh, and might that therefore not be exactly where the pharmaceutical companies are concentrating, presumably? Uh, yeah, I, no, like I say, I've really no problem with the pharma industry. My problem is the way society response probably to, to the pharma industry is, is the, the problem is that we then, that that's becomes the focus, it becomes the target for what we need to do for cognitive ageing and I don't think that that's right and I think that we, it, what it, whatever drug anyone designs to dissolve plaques and tangles which you know we, we know have a tenuous uh, connection with Alzheimer's type dementia anyway we know that from lo loads of neuroimaging and and, and autopsy uh, studies, but whatever whatever we find out, uh, we're always going to have to take it on the chin that we live lives, and we those lives play out in our bodies and in our brains, and and it's kind of the same thing that Arlene's saying. We have to take some responsibility for the way we respond to things, to building our cognitive reserve, to doing, the, and and that's what I'm really thinking there needs to be a lot more knowledge about and a lot more interest in is what are the things that we can do, what are the ways we live our lives that can mean that we're not sitting around waiting for a pill to develop, be developed to stop us from getting dementia. And at least, you know, the, the researchers in America and California think that if we could reduce those seven factors by just 25%, so that's not eliminating midlife obesity, that's reducing the obesity by 25%, reducing the smoking, that we, we, we could have like three, um, three, in America, three million less people with dementia. That's massive. And, you know, and the drugs have done not, nowhere near, they've not come near to doing anything for dementia like that. And okay, that's based on Bayesian statistics and that's some crystal ball, but more or less educated crystal ball as well. But it's it's hopeful, it's much more hopeful than sitting around waiting for a vaccine, I think. Um, do you make your business hourly to keep abreast of developments in the neurosciences or is that just another domain altogether? Actually, um, it's great, the question that you asked there about technology uh, use. Um, I've actually become involved quite recently helping out some um, Irish companies that are interested in the gaming industry and the changes that games make, especially to the prefrontal cortex, um, which is where um, a lot of our thinking, a lot of our um, higher order cognitive uh, capabilities, if you like, um, are stored. So they're interested in seeing these effects in terms of cognitive, um, like that plasticity or you know, development, especially in different kinds of age groups. So we know that currently in this country, there's research going on with the aging population, with um, schizophrenia patients, with Asperger patients, um, and you know these these studies have been going on for the past number of years in this country, and they've certainly been going on in the states for longer. Um, but again, they're using the likes of the fMRIs and and combining different kinds of technology in order to see if there is merit um, to these kinds of techniques to help people to develop their cognitive capabilities and. To, you know, as ways of engaging cognition, and um, especially in different groups and helping people to develop different kinds of cognitive skills. So it is, you know, it's important to kind of keep your eye on all of, all of the balls that are going up uh, in the air at the moment because the way people are engaging the world are so different now to it is what it was, uh, you know, a decade ago. 
Um, and the technology that's out there is helping us to learn more, certainly, in different aspects. But again, you know, the research needs to be done in order for us to help understand its effects. Can I, can I just comment something on that? Just, uh, just okay, there's, somebody, there's a man there who's holding a microphone who's been very polite. Can He's can not, I, not using it. Just ask a question. How many people in the room think we're rational? How many, think, how many people think that we make rational decisions? Ha! <laughs> <Lies. laughs> Two people, I don't believe you. How many people? So, yeah, so the answer is actually there's loads of cognitive research, fMRI research, neuropsychology, neuropsychiatry. Ray Dolan, who's an Irish guy as well actually, who works in London, he's a psychiatrist, has, has, his life's work is looking at decision making. We're incredibly irrational people. We're really irrational. And he's shown it that. And we, we activate our, um, our, our emotion. We work off our, our very basic sort of the bit of the brain that's in the lizard. In the, uh, the emotional circuits. That's, that's how it drives all our amygdala. That's what drives how we think. All of our decision making, you probably know this, yeah. all of our decision making is done in a really, really irrational way. We're incredibly irrational beings. And actually, Ray has shown this, and he's coming to Dublin next year. We have to speaking at our Irish Journal Association um, meeting uh, as part of the, the one of the brain, talking about this business of, of decision making and how you can ma manipulate how people make decisions. And actually, an industry is very interested in this. You would know this as well, Bob. Your, 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 your uh, journalistic is. Industry is very interested in this and, and how you can manipulate uh, people's behaviour by by changing the way that you pose the question or by changing the set of data that you're given. And if you're given the data a certain way, we'll make a certain set of choices. And if you give the exact same data in a different way, they'll make a completely different set of choices. Utterly irrational. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> From the time of the Industrial Revolution, I mean, much of, of the technological breakthroughs, inventions, and so on, really amplified on the whole our physical, human physical abilities, and made us able to do bigger things faster and so on. It's really only the latter end of, of transformation of society that the uh, information communications revolution has really kicked in and is now really the main driver of change. Now, what effect generally is that having on the brain? I just in a very, a very tiny, specific way. For all those of us at a certain age, we spent hours in primary school learning our changes and understanding the world. I mean, I don't think they do that anymore. Is it possible to say, is that a good or a bad thing for brain development and brain power? <laughs> 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 in other words, is the, is the, is the, is the communications revolution, the information revolution, as opposed to the, you know, the, the, the big physical advances and the earlier steps that amplified almost beyond imagination, human physical abilities. Like, is, 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 are we having seen the same thing or what we're going to do now? To How would we ever know the answer to that question? No, but can I just say, they do learn tables, because my daughter's yeah. learning the tables, yeah. driving me mental. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was actually going to say the same thing. It's interesting, uh, in our work in schools, we see the teachers still teach to the same curriculum, but the students that they have in front of them can handle information differently or expect information differently. Um, that the, the contrast that, are, that you're talking about, Michael, um, Michael Gell talks about it quite a lot. He, he draws the comparison between the Industrial Revolution and the Information Revolution. Um, and interestingly, I was curious to know whether within this time and pace of life that we live, you know, our ability to multitask, you see it constantly, right? You see people walking and texting while they have their iPod on, and they're checking the phone for the time, because, yeah. The studies still say that, never mind us being irrational, we're not able to multitask either. And um, so, yeah. Maybe we're not better than that, actually. There's science that disputes. <laughs> um, we think we are. We can convince uh, them that we are. But um, you know, this is this is where the I suppose the the research is heading now. It's to see how we deal so quickly with information. And there's certainly you know having worked with with students across uh, different ages, you see a different expectation around information and around learning than certainly I had when I went through school, which was, you know, you learned it and you gave it back. Now it's tell me it, tell me it now, and uh, tell me the next thing. So there's there's a different, um, the information revolution has certainly made thinking uh, different 
and in ways you know, as challenging, but you find that the younger generation that are growing up with this technology around them are adapting to it uh, quite quickly. Um, but it's those of us who didn't have it growing up that are you know, having to learn it and go through learning as learning, um, you know, getting it wrong, uh, starting again, you know, and keep going or throwing it across the room because can't do it and it's stupid anyway. So, you know, we still go through that, but the, the generations that are growing up with it are certainly learning to manage and, and you can see difference in terms of their ability to cope with the information. So whether or not it's going to change brain fu function and structure, uh, we're going to have to, to wait um, to see you know, what the outcome of that is. But Ian, Ian Robertson has a really interesting, um, you, can, you can find this on Radio 4, it's a, a, four, a forethought um, podcast, and um, he, he's talking about power and how power changes the brain. And it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was launching the book, that's why he was doing that, I remember that memory. <laughs> um, but it is a, it's a fascinating book with loads of very kind of poignant asides about uh, world leaders and yeah. Uh, change, the changes in their brain as a, a result of, of power. So, so it's definitely one to check out. There's a very is, is that the Petraeus factor there as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a microphone there. Would you pass it to Judith? Yes. Yeah. Just as close. Yes. Move it to the right, the top, the top switch. Just, um, just on one thing, where's the past take what you were saying about how we're rational our decision making? And um, reading the book at the moment, actually thinking fast and thinking slow by Daniel Kahneman about that, and just how you can alter how you ask a question and even piece of information and, and how people use their system one. So, in terms of that, in terms of their actual instant reaction things, it's a fascinating point. And just one thing for um, Arlene, as opposed to Lydia or Kate as well. Um, Arlene, you, you, you introduced your talk in terms of how people um, deal with um, a cope with adversity in different ways. I think it's going to take a step back maybe from what Kate's saying because all the research points that you can't cope, it can lead to stress, stress can lead to depression, things like that. So I'm very interested if you have an analogy or something similar to what Kate said about what you would see as the, the sort of factors even that, that people can do to improve their cope with coping adversity and things like that. Yeah, um, what always strikes uh, me when I'm talking with people or working with people, as, as well as the literature, is um, the mindset. Uh, whether or not you have um, a mindset that will allow you to go, you know what, this is a problem, but there's a solution, versus the mindset that allows you to focus only on the negative. And the way that we develop our mindset more often than not is from our past experience. So the experiences and other coping in other kinds of situations, you know, how, what has that pattern of coping been over time? Because we're great at developing habits over years, and then we decide we'll change them in 21 days. And it's, it's hard to do that. So the big thing is to, you know, what, what I've found is that this mindset, uh, this positive mindset, um, will help to see ways out of the problem. And you know, often that's going to be one of the, the big things. The other side of it as well is how you know, quite often people who have a social support system around them, you know, people that can help you out of the problem, uh, that's going to lead to a more positive outcome because it's those people who are isolated and struggling on their own that you know you find it harder, you don't get the reinforcement from you know other people to say that you're on the right track or here I'll give you a hand. You know, sometimes that's what you need. But ultimately for, you know, when, when I'm working with the clients that I'm working with, um, and you just see the, the language they use around the problem, and the aspects that they choose to focus on around the problem are often like, significantly different and significantly more positive. Uh, they see it as a transient phase, um, something that they can come out of or something that will be you know, successfully negotiated. Uh, as opposed to the other side of it, which will either mean that that individual will take longer to address the problem or be stuck, you know, for for that uh, amount of time. I don't know, Kate, if you've noticed any. Well, the non the non study. I don't know if people have heard of the non study. There was a study done in America on a, a group of nuns who. Um, Donated their bodies to medical science after death, and one of the one of the most interesting things from that study was that the, the people who 
the, the nuns who had a really positive mindset did tend to fare better in their aging process cognitively than the ones with the negative mindset. So that's that's something that's sprung to mind. Maybe it just works. With I, I know it's far too late to start a discussion about what's positive and what's negative. Surely, critical thinking is precisely looking at both parts, mm -hmm. both the positive and the negative. But anyway. Uh, Maybe that's for that's for a discussion over a beer. We're very near that point actually of discussion over the beer. Is, 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 is there a, is the A solution, the B solution, the Heineken solution? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, we'll take the last, we'll round up the last. We won't take any quick response, we'll just get through the last three, four questions, five. Okay. Oh, we get the last four or oh, five and then we give you all one minute or two to respond. Okay. Or you want to start with yeah. <laughs> I had a quick question, but it might be a panel one to um, Several speakers refer to this cognitive bank or cognitive reserve, which I sort of take it as well to be the, maybe a sort of measure of kind of capability or potential at any point. Is there any, how far are we from understanding that as a sort of neurological or physiological phenomenon? Is that a metaphor or is it actually something real? I think no, no, we no, no, no. We'll, take, we'll, take, we'll take more questions. Think about it. Um, this is probably a question for Kate, carrying on from her very rationally thought out um, discussion on drug, drugs and drug companies and, and the development of drugs for neuro related diseases. And you quite rightly pointed out that. Like, we shouldn't focus on drugs to address uh, <coughs> Alzheimer's or whatever. But as you pointed out, drugs don't seem to work very effectively at the moment. And addressing things like uh, obesity, uh, smoking, diabetes would be much more effective. So wouldn't it make sense for the drug companies to work on making drugs for countering obesity, countering... <laughs> well, uh, they are. <laughs> well, they are working on those things as well, yeah. I mean, they are working on those things as well. So they should stop working on drugs for the Alzheimer's? Well, I don't, I don't think, I'm not, that's not what I'm calling, I'm not calling for a stop on looking for drugs for dementia. That is definitely not my argument. My argument is for better balance. And the research, or the kind of lifestyle issues that cause diseases, and I wonder, is medical science looking how to make people change their lifestyles because people are just highly, highly, highly resistant to change. Highly irrational. Highly irrational. And when the state tries to persuade people to do it, they get called an anti-state, they're very, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, what can we do with this world of irrational and blood line of tension and chases? I don't really care. Okay. Um, is the cognitive reserve a real thing or is it just a, a, a metaphor as well? There's like the talk I didn't understand. <laughs> there's a there's a neurologist in Trinity. Ar Aaron Giller Aaron. Or a book of well, yeah, yeah, neuroscientist. Yeah, neuroscientist, sorry. Um, and he has spent a really long time with his MRI machine trying to find cognitive reserve under all sorts of different conditions and he hasn't found anything and he's really, really fed up and I went to him one time saying, Hey fancy doing any research on cognitive reserve and he nearly poked me in the eye because <laughs> he's just fed up with trying to chase it and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a the holy grail that we're all trying to find out what it is, what it really is. Um, so I, the, the jury's out definitely can't, I can't answer that uh, that question. Is that um, who wants to take the question of uh, changing lifestyles? How, I, I mean this is also a communication question. Yeah. Okay. So actually I was going to respond to that earlier what they would say. That there is a I mean Kate has I didn't agree with some of what you were saying, but that some, some of I, I do agree with because one of the things that we really do need to do is is to engage in these very very extensive longitudinal studies looking at um, things that people do and the effects that they have, like what you're doing. Uh, we're actually an ideal population to do this. The, the the best countries that do this, but they do them they don't write in English, so we don't really always see when they arrive on the Scandinavians. I sit on the, uh, the Finnish Academy of Science, Neuroscience uh, panel, and they do brilliant studies looking at uh, longitudinal, very long longitudinal studies of um, people doing, you know, looking at lifestyles, looking at lifestyle modification. Now, the Finnish Academy of Science funds that sort of research, um, and the EU is funding your research, but actually it's very difficult 
to get funding for that sort of research. I, I do epidemiology research and set up databases, and they're very difficult to fund because they don't generate data that you can actually you know, publish in three years or put a PhD student through in three years. And there is a bit of a problem on that. It's a big issue um, in Ireland at the moment uh, around the sort of way, the model that we treat fund science. And I don't know if people want to get the debate or, or, or aware of the debate around the, the appointment of uh, the, the dissolution of the um, scientific advisor and, and, and incorporating that into the director general of SFI. And there are many of us who think that that may well be a slightly counterproductive move, uh, but also putting money into SFI and then SFI, the, the new director general of SFI, has a very strong jobs driven agenda. SFI is very jobs driven now. It's around turning knowledge into jobs, turning research into jobs that make the economy run, the knowledge economy. Um, and actually that's, that's really important, but there's a real risk that we will lose out on the more meaningful sort of work that gives us a longer dividend, that the, 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 the benefit is much more long term, but, but, um, but doesn't generate anything like, the, you know, it doesn't generate patents or jobs or bringing multinationals. So we, we really have to be very careful about, about this. We need to reset our agenda a little bit in terms of the, the benefit of supporting scientific research that's research for in its own matter that's valuable for the society and epidemiology and database generation and infrastructure development or something like things that get squeezed out very early on when there's a bit of a funding crisis going on. So, so I, I think you're right, and I think the comment that the question about how do we change your behaviours, the way you change your behaviours actually is to generate data and then influence policy. And policy will then determine how we how we behave because there'll be certain incentives will be incentivized in certain ways to do things and, and, and we can start that off very early on but unless we have data we can't influence policy and in, in order to have data we need to invest in the sort of research that generates data and that's very hard fund at the moment. So imagine the policymakers are being convinced by all the data that they need to do something absolutely fundamental about changing people's behaviours. Could you come up with a program for 50 million euro to change people's sure, behaviour? Give it a try, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> okay, last, last comment, Kate. Do you want to uh, pick up anything at all? Um, what was the last question? Not the last question, the one before. Addictive the technologies, last... about brain dead, uh, about lifestyle mm. drugs, about changing lifestyles, about mm. dealt with the cognitive reserve. I think we leave a lot of those questions floating, if you don't mind, mm. uh, because we're not in the business of trying to tie up all the knots and mm. tie up all the threads here. Anything else that's burning your brain. No, nothing. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the brain in my stomach thinking. Arlene? Uh, no, just on that, you know, with the change of lifestyle that we have, it's, you know, it comes back to the point that we made earlier about, you know, it's up to us to kind of take responsibility and not get sucked into the sedentary lifestyle to the unhealthy choices and to keep bringing with us what we, what we had that, um, you know, served us well. So to bring the good stuff forward and Embrace uh, the new change as we have it. Can I, can I make one final comment? I think you just get in before the music. Well done. Okay, one final comment. The R, we, we've done some work um, in our epidemiology, and the life, the average life, the life expectancy in Ireland has gone up from from the time we started looking at nineteen ninety four to now. It's gone up uh, by two years. Uh, the, 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 the average life expectancy is eighty three and eighty one. I think for women and men. The, the, the age of onset of rare disease has gone up immensely. So, so you're, as we age better, um, we're healthier, we're actually healthier than we were 15 or 20 years ago. And our, our chronological age and our biological age are separating. So we are, we are, and we know this because our parents um, and those of us who are over a certain age are, you know, the 50s and you 40s, 60s, 50s, 80s, and 70s. So, so our, our, our biological age is slowing down. And, and extending out, and I think that really supports what Kate is saying. And in fact, we don't really understand the relationship between chronological age, biological age, and, and, and age-related diseases. But we know that we do know the connection, and we know that the stuff that Kate is saying is true. That if you have a healthy lifestyle, you could actually your body ends up being a little bit younger than your chronological age, and your age-related diseases actually get kicked out until you're older. That's a nice encouraging note in which to end. Uh, I think uh, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to our three panels for very sporting uh, <laughs> engagement with each other and with you and with the questions that were being thrown around. So please show your appreciation for all the hard work.